Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good to uh, good to be here this morning on this rather cold, snowy day. That's for sure. Um, but oh, sorry, you you guys are getting ahead of me. <laughs> Let me just say that I can't even uh, can't, can't quite get this uh, together this morning. I guess. Um, but you're already on here. You're already checking in on Facebook. I'm already getting texts. Wonderful. You're you're uh, you know what I'm going to say before I say it. Any I guess. Anyway, I'm Brian. I'm the pastor here at Christ United Methodist Church. I'll just turn my volume down on that. Good to have you with me this morning on, uh, as we continue our journey through the book of Exodus, going through a chapter a day, give or take. So today we're up to day 12. We're on day 12, uh, chapter 12, which is a fairly long chapter, longer chapter. So that kind of makes up for uh, yesterday's short one, I guess, perhaps. Uh, so just a, an announcement reminder, give, give more folks a chance to, to sign in here. Might be uh, running just a little bit late, which is uh, perfectly understandable. Um, but a reminder is that Sunday worship, it does resume in person. Yay, excited about that. Um, so that means we'll be having two in-person worship services, one at 8.15 and one at 10.45. Now, what does that mean to you if you're only tuning in for the, the Bible study? Well, it means I'm probably not going to be on right at nine o'clock on Sunday morning with this. Uh, that will depend on what time the early service you know, wraps up and I get to have a, uh, a take a breath and maybe grab a, a cup of coffee or something. Um, so it's probably going to be more like 9.15-ish uh, before we get go live. So um, if you haven't already done so, sign up for notifications here on Facebook and they will let you know when uh, when we go live when we go live so that's good um, 1045 of course will still also be live streamed so it, you, you're welcome to join us on campus but if you're uncomfortable doing that totally understand it don't worry about it uh, you can continue to uh, to uh, to worship with us right here online uh, so let me just catch up here on my good morning because I do appreciate that, folks. I really do. The fact that you're, you say hello, let us know that you're here. It is a beautiful morning, Pat. Um, cold and snowy out there, but uh, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty to watch that stuff come down, which is mostly all I'm doing is watching it come down from inside, <laughs> uh, which is why I'm coming from the home office today. So no green screen here. Um, and if I tried to do a, a background picture, it would get lost because of stuff on the wall. It just wouldn't look right. So uh, you're just going to have to look at me instead of whatever I might try to put up on the back. Uh, so I think we gave, gave folks time. We're ready. And Brother Ron has checked in and he says good morning to everyone as well. And let's get into chapter 12. Now, chapter 12, of course, it's an interesting chapter. Um, when, when last we spoke, the pronouncement had been made what the plague would be, what the next plague would be, that God would, um, and it didn't say kill. Uh, it almost, in, in literally in, in the Hebrew, in the original language, um, it, it's more like allow to die. Um, it, but it does show God's control over life itself and and if god takes away that then death is what's going to happen um, uses some different wording in this chapter that's where we left it god the uh, moses had made the pronouncement and yes uh, cindy had made the comment uh, sent me a text what's going on in in chapter 10 pharaoh said next time i if you ever like show up in front of me again you'll be dead and moses says you're right i'll never see your face again um, but here we are in chapter 11, Moses does go before Pharaoh. However, you know, diff different people say different things. Maybe he wasn't exactly in Pharaoh's presence. Maybe he was like yelling to him from a distance to avoid it. Or uh, more logically, it was just kind of hyperbole and stuff that was said in the heat of the moment uh, by Pharaoh. Um, why, why Pharaoh didn't kill Moses before now is, is anybody's guess or conjecture. Uh, but you know, so it was right. You picked up on that. That was good. And uh, Moses is going to appear before Pharaoh again. 
Okay, and that, that will take place today. That will take place today. Uh, this is an interesting passage because it starts with the narrative and it kind of, and it ends with the narrative, but in inserted in between is something different. Okay, something something different. So we'll talk about that when we get there. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, Hashem gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the, the year for you. Pause. So right here is where we're getting that insertion. Okay, it has the narrative that they're still in Egypt. Now it goes into something different. It's going to go into something different. But God is saying, uh, right now, this is going to be a new year. Time is being reset. Time is being reset. This month, whatever it is, which, which is actually our spring, uh, usually falls in March and April. Um, this, this, this is the beginning of a new year for you. Um, so it's God, God saying, time is resetting for you, starting all over. This is, is how your calendar is going to run from now on. This is how your calendar is going to run from now on. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the family according divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Pause. So this, this is what's different about it. This now is uh, going, going to put in an explanation and a reasoning for festivals that, that become a, an important part of the, of the Hebrew tradition, of the Israelite tradition, of the Judaic faith. Two in particular, two in particular, the festival of unleavened bread and the festival that we usually refer to as Passover. In Hebrew, it's Pesach. Um, so it's those two, which although they take place like right up against each other, and we might think that it's all the same. It's not. It's two different things. One is celebrated for, for seven days. That's the festival of unleavened bread. And one is just one day. That's, that's Passover. That's Pesach. All right. So it's the two. So this whole insertion here is given the background and the reasoning for it. Um, so so it, this might come from that deuteronomical tradition, the priestly tradition of, of the oral and, and, pre, and early written versions of this story to provide a, an explanation for people of why they do things. Um, so it's making it, it's putting in this liturgical aspect, putting in the liturgical aspect. Now what's really interesting and cool about this and great about this, so each family is supposed to have their, whole, their own animal, their own sheep or goat. Um, but these families were all slaves, right? Um, it, basically living in poverty. So God is providing for that aspect. Uh, when God says, you know, if a family, uh, you know, can't have a whole animal, a whole lamb, yes, eat, but also a fourth, okay? They should share. They should share. They should share. And, and it's not only if my family can't afford one, I should go to somebody else's family. It, it's, more, it's more the opposite. It's more the opposite. If you can have a whole lamb, but you can't eat the whole thing, then you should go to your neighbor who can't afford one and join up with them. That's what's taking place. That's, what's, that's what the context is in this. And the important aspect of it is that the entire community is to participate, is to take part in this, in this festival and in, in, in this meal. Okay, that, that's the, the important aspect that, that everybody is, is coming together. Continuing with verse six, take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Pause. So you, they, they choose the animal on the 10th. 
that's the one we're going to have. That's the one. You, you, your days are numbered, kid. Huh. Uh, you, your days are numbered. You're, that, that's the one we're going to have. But you're not going to eat it yet. You're going to take care of it for four days, for four days. And then continue. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel, everybody, must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. Pause. So again, this emphasis on the entire community, everyone's doing it the same night, not only the same night, the same time. At twilight, they are to, to, to slaughter the animal for, for the meal, for the Passover meal. Um, and sprinkle, it does say sprinkle some of the blood uh, on, on the, yours probably says door, doorposts and lintel. Okay, so the sides and the top of the door frames. Continuing, verse 8, that same night they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the heads, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before before morning okay so the entire animal has to be eaten or or burned up or burned up and it does talk about the the bitter herbs and stuff which that again this is part of that this is this is part of that liturgy of the the seder meal of the the, the pasach of the passover meal um eating bitter herbs to remind them of their their bitter labors, the tears of, of their labors of, uh, while, while, whilst in slavery, okay? Um, so it really sounds like that priestly tradition, putting something in here to explain why we do the things we do. Continuing, verse 11, these are your instructions for eating this meal. This stuff's important. Be fully dressed. Uh, yours probably say have your loins girded. Wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is Hashem's Passover. Pause. What all of those things indicate is the need for speed. The need for speed. Um, you need to be ready to go, ready to depart, ready to start the journey. So you need to eat the meal uh, with fully dressed loins girded, you know, you got your belt on, uh, you got your stick in hand, your walking stick, your staff in hand, uh, and you've got your shoes on your feet. You're ready to go. That's, that's what's important about that. From India. We've got somebody joining us from India this morning. Welcome, my friend. Welcome. kind of got thrown there for a moment. <laughs> so uh, that, that's the important, that's why these details here, okay? Uh, eating, it, eating it quickly to show the urgency, to show the urgency. It's all based upon urgency, which is why, and we'll find out in a little bit, the, the reason for the unleavened bread. They don't say yet why, but it's because of that sense of urgency. Spoiler alert, it's because they, they uh, didn't they didn't have time to let the, 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 the dough rise, the yeast take effect. So they had to take it with them quickly and just kind of eat it before it had risen. Continuing. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son of ever and every, oh, sorry. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am Hashem. Pause. This is the first time that God has mentioned that. This is the first time that this is that the authors have included that statement in here. Uh, prior to this, Hashem has not mentioned the gods of Egypt. I said that each of the plagues was a, a, a a strike against one of the gods of Egypt. Now God is being clear. Now God is being clear. Prior to this time, everything that God has said was against Pharaoh and the officials. 
uh, this seems to be a, uh, th this now is God saying, not only are they responsible for what's been taking place here, but I'm holding the gods of Egypt responsible for allowing this slavery, for allowing this mistreatment of these people. And they will not be successful in, in, uh, in they, they will not be successful against me. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Pause for again for a mo just for a moment. Why? Uh, you know, in the first couple, the first couple of the plagues, God, uh, Hashem, God, and uh, the plagues hit everyone. Then God said, you know what? I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to show you my abilities and I will discern and I will prevent the plagues from striking uh, the, the, uh, the Hebrews, the slaves, those living in the slave camps. Um, God was able to tell the difference between them. So why now can't God? It's not that God can't. God certainly can. Again, this sounds like that priestly tradition coming in to explain something. But it also, uh, it also indicates a, an action, on the part, a, a necessary action on the part of the Hebrews, on the part of the slaves, uh, to, be, to be participants in their own freedom to be in their participants in their own freedom. That's probably a good explanation for it or as good as any other anyway. Uh, it's not that God needed to because God could certainly tell, uh, but they needed to be participants in it. This is a, continuing. This is a day of remembrance. Sorry, my lighting in my, my room isn't very good, I guess. And my eyes are old. Uh, this is a day to remember. Each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to Hashem. This is a law for all time. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. Uh, on the first day of the festival, and again on the seventh day, all the people must observe an official day for holy assembly. No work of any kind may be done on these days, except in the preparation of food. Pause. So uh, if, if someone were to, re to eat leavened bread, they're cut off. This goes back to that idea, and yes, it is that li the liturgy, the priestly liturgy coming in there. Why do we do the, what we do? Um, but it's because of that need for speed. By, by instituting this festival of unleavened bread, they are remembering, uh, which we can break that to remember, uh, again, be part of, to again, be part of something. So when, e even today, if when a, a Jewish family, a Jewish synagogue gathers together for the Pesach, they are being part of, uh, once again, being part of what took place then, 30, 300 years ago. Okay. And so by eating leavened bread, the person is put taking themselves out of the community. By eating leavened bread, they are not uh, they are not in a hurry. Uh, they're not showing that eagerness, that need for speed. Uh, in a way, they are showing being comfortable in Egypt, and no one should be comfortable in Egypt. It would be the point there. Continuing, celebrate this festival of unleavened bread, for it will remind you that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very day. This festival will be a permanent law for you. Celebrate this day from generation to generation. The bread you eat must be made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day of the first month until the evening of the 21st day of that month. During those seven days, there must be no trace of yeast in your homes. Anyone who eats anything made with yeast during this week will be cut off from the community of Israel. 
These regulations apply both to the foreigners living among you and to the native born Israelites. During those days, you must not eat anything made with yeast. Wherever you live, eat only bread made without yeast. Pause. Is it repetitive? Yes, it's repetitive. Why? This is an oral tradition. Remember, these stories were oral traditions shared again and again and again. Consequently, a couple things happen. Repetition is the easiest way to get people to remember things. So you're kind of keeping it simple. You're repeating again and again. This is what's taking place. This is why it's taking place. Do this, do this, do this. So it makes it easy for people to remember the story and to remember what's going on. Uh, continuing, then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, go pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover meal, that Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin, then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses, and no one may go out through the door until morning. Moses kind of added that on on his own. <laughs> For Hashem will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe, Hashem will pass over your home. He will, not he will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land Hashem has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to Hashem. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshiped. So the people of Israel did just as Hashem had commanded through Moses and Aaron. Pause. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Th this, this whole section, uh, these two, this, this section here, um, can, be, can be divided into two things. There's the commandment, like the, the, the instructions, let's put it that way, the instructions, the orders, and the obedience and the obedience. The instructions part, the, the requirements, the, the, that, that's a long piece. The obedience part is, is pretty small. <laughs> it's just one, one verse, and right, rightly so. But it does demonstrate a, uh, it does, it does it demonstrate compliance and obedience on their part, and that they, they did it rather quickly as well. Continuing, uh, this is verse 29. And that night at midnight, uh, again, the darkest part of the night, the time when Pharaoh has absolutely no control over the chaos. Hashem struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, the, the heir to the throne, who sat on his throne to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pause. So it is exactly as pronounced, exactly as predicted in chapter uh, 10, or 11, sorry, 11, uh, of what was going to happen. Uh, firstborn sons of, of everyone, including Pharaoh. So it's the heir to the throne. Um, and even the poorest person, this person in a, in a dungeon, um, they all suffered the same fate and all the animals. Again, it happens at midnight, the darkest part of the night, the time when Pharaoh has absolutely no control over chaos is when it happens and nobody sees a thing. So it, we don't, it doesn't say how it happened or how they died um, because nobody was there to see it. Nobody could see this thing happen. Um, but demonstrating God's ultimate control over, over life and death. But here in the middle of the night, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
Oh, Ron, Ron says his NIV. The NIV says only says firstborn, doesn't say firstborn sons. Um, sons is kind of understood, we might say. You know, uh, the NLT says firstborn sons. Technically, the it may not be there in Hebrew. I don't know for sure. I would have to check on that. Uh, you know what? Let me see what the NRS says on that passage. Yes, I have more than one Bible. <laughs> Uh, what verse is that? Uh, the NRSV only says firstborn as well. So uh, probably literally in Hebrew, that's all that's there. Uh, but New Living Translation chose to, uh, to, to indicate firstborn sons, which probably fits the context, <clears throat> excuse me, as uh, you know, in in societies at that time, it was the firstborn son that was considered more important. That also would tie back in to what happened back in chapters, you know, chapter two, chapter one, two, when uh, when Pharaoh had all the all the sons being killed. That this would echo, this would parallel or mirror mirror that. Okay, and remember the cry that was put up then. And there's a cry put up now, uh, although this cry, as had been said in chapter 11, is, is much more of a significant cry, uh, deeper than, than any cry ever had been or will be. Yeah, they might have taken a slight liberty, but it's, it, it fits to the parallel and the, the mirror image. Awesome. Okay, continuing. This is verse 31, I think. It prints so small. Yeah. Uh, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Again, it's still during the night when Pharaoh doesn't have any power. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship Hashem as you have requested. Uh, pause. They, they translate it worship, but that word is serve. The word is serve. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh is saying, uh, you go have a different master. Take your flocks and, sir, yeah, go, yeah. Take your flocks and herds as you said and be gone. Go, but bless me as you leave. As the, all the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible for they thought we will all die. Pause. So Pharaoh in his declaration here, has, has uttered the, the multiple words, the multiple verbs that God has requested him to utter in the past, but absolutely refused. He's saying go, sending. Uh, he's saying that serve word, um, and take. He's, he's using these words that God had wanted him to take, Hashem had wanted him to take, but he refused. And now he's adding one to it. And this one is the biggest surprise of all. He says, bless me as you leave, bless me as you go, bless me before you leave, whatever, however it is. Pharaoh, as a God, was the one responsible for blessing people, for blessing others. But now Pharaoh has perhaps realized how weak and powerless he is and how powerful Hashem is. And he is now asking for a blessing. Continuing, the Israelites took their bread dough before yeast was added. They wrapped their kneading boards in their cloaks and carried them on their shoulders. And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. Hashem caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. Pause. Yeah. Um, kind of hidden in here because we don't see it in English. Now it says stripped in mine, uh, plundered. I think is how the NIV and the NRSV puts that in that in those last that thing. It says it stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. They plundered Egypt. Um, the word that here is translated stripped and and plundered is used. It's nasal is used elsewhere and translated save and rescue. It's that word that was described that what God was going to do for the Israelites and 
uh, remember? Moses kind of threw it back in his face. You said you were going to rescue them, but you haven't done anything yet. But God said, I will rescue. It's the same word, nasal, which literally means snatched. So when God uses it, when it's used to, in uh, God's dialogue, it's snatched from, from slavery, sl snatched out of danger, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but here, the same word is being used for, for what the, uh, the Israelites, what the slaves are doing to their Hebrew former master, their is Egyptian former masters. They're snatching away their wealth. That night, the people of Israel left Ramesses, that's the, the, the city of Ramesses, not the person, and started for Sokoth. There were about 600,000 men, plus all the women and children. Pause. This is kind of important, for, I guess, for me to say right now. When, when you're reading numbers in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, please don't take them literally. Please don't take them literally for, for multiple reasons. One, they're... Uh, many times, many times they're symbolic. So this number here, uh, we can read as being a large group or all of the people, all of the people. The other thing is to remember, um, these, these are oral stories. They were oral traditions passed on from, from person to person and generation to generation for a few hundred years before anyone even thought about writing them down, before anybody could write them down, perhaps is how I should rephrase that. So what happens when a person tells a story, tells a story, tells a story, right? Uh, if you ever played the game called by different names, gossip or telephone as a, as a, as a child, when you whisper some, a sentence or a story into somebody's ear and they whisper it into somebody's ear and somebody's ear, by the time it gets to the end, it, it has very little similarity to the original. Um, but maybe I heard, you know, you said 600 people, I thought you said 600,000 uh, kind of thing. Not that quick, obviously. Uh, but that, that's one thing that could happen. The other thing is once it, even once it was written down and started to coalesce, and coalesce into what we have as an exodus, uh, if, I wanted to, if I wanted a copy of it, you had a copy, you had, you had the document and I wanted a copy of it. I couldn't take it to Kinko's or to the UPS store or, or run it through my computer and print off multiple copies. I would have to sit there and hand write it. And I might have trouble reading your handwriting. And you had 6,000, I thought it said 60,000. And the next person thought it was 600,000. So that's how that kind of happens. And it, stories, stories grow, stories, people, storytellers exaggerate. Um, and that kind of thing happens. So don't look at the numbers so literally. Were there 600,000? I seriously doubt it. Um, and that would explain, to me, that would explain a lot about the, the lack of historical and archeological evidence of, of the event of, of Exodus. If there were 600,000 people leaving Egypt, I think there would be more of a record uh, of it. There would be more evidence, but if it was a smaller group, it makes more sense that it would not have uh, have evidence. There would not be so much evidence. Okay, so anyway, uh, makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them, along with great flocks and herds of livestock. Um, rabble. I'm not really happy with the New Living Translation on that word, and I forget what the NRSV uh, V says, but uh, I think it says mixed 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 people. Uh, it, this is important because what, what this is saying is that the Exodus wasn't a wasn't literally a clan, uh, you know, a family thing taking place with just the with the tribes of Israel, which becomes which is important. And that's how they divide them up by tribes. And that's how they divide the land of Canaan once they get there. Um, but it isn't literally descendants of, of Jacob and his, his, his boys. Um, it is Hebrews. It is all the slaves. It is the downtrodden and the outcast. And that's this mixed group that they're talking about here. Um, so it's, it's, it's more important than just a clan thing taking place. Uh, and the, the other important part is all of these 
all of the livestock that's coming along. For bread, they baked flat cakes from the dough without yeast they had brought from Egypt. It was made without yeast because the people were driven out of Egypt in such a hurry that they had no time to prepare the bread or other food. Now we know why the priestly tradition gives that instructions um, in, in the Pesach meal. The people of Israel had lived in, in Egypt for 430 years. Again, don't take the number series, literally. In fact, it was on the last day of the four, 430th year that all the Hashem's forces left, left the land. On this night, Hashem kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated every year by the Israelites from generation to generation. Uh, pause. Yeah. Uh, and again, that it's uh, this one says it was uh, a night belongs to 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 him. Night belongs to Hashem. The, the NRSV translates it as uh, the Lord's vigil. So what what it really is saying is that God was keeping watch. Uh, it this does have a very militaristic sound to how it's being described they're going out company by company and uh you know in the in very orderly fashion very orderly fashion of leaving um and it has god keeping vigil so it's as it says it's kind of saying that god was was right there as the commanding general or captain or whatever the general uh watching the troops going out and watching them start on their journey and very concerned and just in case I'm here, just in case, you know, Egypt changes their mind and tries to come after you, okay? I'm here, I'm keeping watch, I'm keeping watch. Then Hashem said to Moses and Aaron, these are the instructions for the festival of Passover. No outsiders are allowed to eat the Passover meal. But any slave who has been purchased may eat it if he has been circumcised. Temporary residents and hired servants may not eat it. Each Passover lamb must be eaten in one house. Do not carry any of its meat outside and do not break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate this Passover festival. If there are foreigners living among you who want to celebrate Ha Hashem's Passover, let all their males be circumcised. Only then may they celebrate the Passover with you like any native-born Israelite. But no uncircumcised male may ever eat the Passover meal. This instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreigner living among you. So all the people of Israel followed all of Hashem's commands to Moses and Aaron. On that very day, Hashem brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. End of chapter. End of chapter. So God does say in this that uh, only, uh, only you, only you, only you Israelites, only you Hebrews, only you that were bringing up out of Egypt and your descendants, native born, can participate in the Passover meal with some exceptions, with some exceptions, uh, a slave who has been uh, been bought uh, as long as they've been circumcised. It makes a distinction temporary residents versus permanent residents. Okay. Permanent residents who are willing to become circumcised are allowed to participate in this meal. But temporary residents or, you know, aliens, just which, which the, the, uh, a better translation, the, what the word is, is sojourner, almost like a migrant worker, okay? Uh, a temp, but a temporary resident and this sojourner alien uh, is only going to be there for a little while. They're not allowed. But if a person wants to become part of the community, the whole idea of, of the Pesach meal, the Seder, is community. The entire community takes part of it. So if someone wants to become part of the community by being a permanent resident and by being circumcised, uh, then yes, they can they can participate. But somebody who's only here for a little while, no, they're they're not they're not really part of the community. They're just here. Okay, so that would be the difference. It's interesting differences, but uh, it kind of makes sense when we remember that it's all about this this idea of the whole community. 
participating, but you got to be part of the community. Well, folks, that's it for today. Um, tomorrow's Friday, so nothing tomorrow or Saturday. Sunday will be our next one, and what that'll be chapter 13 on Sunday, um, and it will be between the two worship experiences. So 9.15, 9.30, somewhere in there. Sign up for notifications so Facebook will let you know exactly what time it will be taking place. Uh, I hope that God has spoken to you this morning through my words. Um, keep your spiritual eyes and ears open today for what God is doing in your life, for the active part that God is playing in your life, in the life of those around you today. And when you see it, when you hear it, Tell, thank God, and then tell somebody because they need to hear about it so that they can see it too. Uh, be blessed, my friends. Have a great day.